on today's show. What could Derek Lively bring to the Dallas Mavericks if they decide to take him with the 10th pick in the draft? We'll break it down and more on today's Lockdown Mavericks. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Lockdown Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks NBA champion. He hit it by It's good. And the Mavericks have won the game. I don't believe you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. Welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On Mavs your first listen every day. Join the Raccoon Squad, be an everydayer, subscribe or follow for free. Just search Locked On Mavericks wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. But the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day and to comment anything below. Let us know in the comment section. Should the Mavericks take Derek Lively if there are no acceptable trades? Let's say there's no trade. Who else would you take instead? Let us know. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash LockedOnNBA when you enter the promo code LockedOnNBA. They'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. If you want to support us and support this show, subscribe to our subtext. I was texting people today. I text people pretty much every day. Uh, We'll send you guys any rumors that we hear. We'll send uh, reports that we'll hear from other people. We'll send all that stuff. So to keep up to date and to support the show, subscribe to our subtext. Click the link. And joining me, as always, my co-host, writer, contributor at Mavs.com. The lively, livid, the one more thinking, what you got for me, Isaac Harris? We're getting so close to the draft. Yesterday was, uh, gosh, two weeks, right? Two weeks from the from the draft. It'd be Thursday. That's it. That's insane. That we're almost here. It's insane that it feels like we're getting like NBA news every day at this point, and it's in the middle of the finals, and there's just new rumors, mock drafts. It's. I mean, we're getting really close. We say there's, you know, there's a there's two times of the year that's you know the most wonderful time of the year. It's it's trade deadline week. Those forty eight hours leading up. And then it's just this whole kind of like month leading into free agency, a draft, all of that. Oh, yeah. We will have you covered. We do five days a week all throughout the offseason, so we'll have you covered. Nobody else is doing this. Nobody – do you think that if you added all the other Mavs podcasts episode, like just episode count through the end of the season to the beginning of the season, do you think any of them equal the amount of episodes we're about to do? Oh, gosh. Uh, probably not, no. Nobody yeah. else giving it to you like – like, like we're going to give it to you. Uh, I don't know if that makes us insane, but we're going to do it. Been doing it for six years now. Yeah. Let's do this. Today, though, we're going to talk about Derek Lively. He is a, a player that a lot of people have mocked to the Dallas Mavericks in mock drafts and different things. Player that fits a lot of the, the issues and the problems the Mavericks have. And so we're going to talk about if he would be an acceptable draft choice. He is, we'll go through strengths, weaknesses. We go through his availability. If we think he's going to be there, ceiling, floor, different comps in the league, uh, what we think his role would be on the Mavericks. We talk about all that kind of stuff in our draft profiles. We've done a couple of these already. We did Taylor Hendricks, Jairus Walker, Anthony Black, and then Anthony Black put Isaac's uh, soliloquy about him in his own like docu-series, so you can go check out that. I got to be more about him now. We did uh, the Grady Dick one. That was a pod. We did that. And now let's talk about Derek Lively. So seven foot one. He's listed in some places as 215 pounds, other places as 230 pounds. So it seems like he's bulked up since he was first listed. I've also seen his wingspan listed at seven four in some places and seven seven in other places. I think seven seven's yeah. the actual one, but he definitely has a long wingspan, definitely longer than his height. Going to be 19 years old at the time of the draft. Went to Isaac's favorite college, Duke. And he's a highly touted recruit who hasn't met expectations, but has great tools, defensive versatility, and offensive upside. Yeah, you know, I think something important to uh, mention about his measurement stuff, he didn't do anything at the combine. Right. um, Which, you know, I'd say, you know, there are a handful of dudes. I mean, there there were a lot of guys that's going to be drafted, even in the top 10. I mean, you look at guys like Jarris Walker, Cam Whitmore, Taylor Hendricks, um, you know, even, even the Thompson brothers did a few things, you know, they did some measurements and stuff, but, um, for Lively's camp, they didn't do anything and they're banking on, you know, he's such a unique prospect in the sense of ESPN's class of 2022. He was the rated, the right. number one player in the country, uh, as far as, you know, high school basketball player. Um, Does that sound familiar. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, number one ranked player that is going to go a lot lower in the draft than like top five. And yeah, and, and, and it's kind of weird because you know he's this number one ranked player in high school. He, you know, he has offers from. I mean, he whatever school he basically wanted to go to, but you know, he had offers from Carolina and you know, Kentucky. Chose Duke and. He goes there and it's like this kind of weird season. He has he has this injury. He plays, you know, this style of game in, in college. You know, the, the biggest thing for him, obviously watch a decent amount of a ACC basketball and not as much as I used to, not as much even when we first started, you know, started doing this pod six years ago. But as kids come along, um, sports start to dwindle outside of the NBA. <laughs> it's like I used to be in base into baseball and college basketball and all these things. And now it's just, NBA and NFL. Uh, but you you look at him, it, how he played at Duke, and even, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll talk a lot about probably is his shot and compared it to, like, what, what kind of big will he be, you know, in the league and stuff. But just look at what he did well at Duke and picture that in the league and that he's going to be able to do that really well in the league. So if, if all else fails, what he is really good at at, at Duke – He's going to be good at in the NBA, and therefore his floor is going to be a little higher as a big. You look at his numbers, and I think that if you hadn't if you hadn't watched anything of him, you say, all right, he only played 20 minutes a game, five points, five rebounds, two and a half blocks. That's pretty good, but oh, like, yeah. you're just not seeing a lot of stats there uh, and only in 20 minutes in, in college. And so you're like, okay, well, why would we take a guy that only averaged five points, five rebounds and like, couldn't play? For, for Duke, but you just look, you said, you, you look at all the different tools he has and the different things that he can do, and you try and put that in some more spacing in the NBA. You put that with a uh, better scheme in the NBA, more time to run that scheme in college. You got these one and done players that just drop into like a storied franchise or storied like program in, in Duke, and you're like, all right, just run this thing, and you don't have much time to do it. And then by the time the season's done, they're out of there. Cause, but, is there yeah, a one and, and done? And it, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to gauge some of these guys who go in the big schools. You look at like Paolo uh, in that Duke team. Right. I mean, look how many players they had to get drafted from that team with Mark Williams and um, Wendell Moore. Gosh, I mean, I feel like I'm even forgetting some or AJ Griffin. Um, but you know, Paolo's on this team, and some people are like watching just some of the Paolo stuff at Duke, and like I don't know. But when you really dug into it, it's like all right, no, Paolo's Paolo's a guy. Um, and, and for Lively, he's one of those dudes that you have to go back and look at some of the high school stuff. Um, you got to look at it, it. You can't judge everything about him in those games that he just had at Duke, which was still good. Um, but to see kind of like what he could be at the next level, you have to dip into some of the high school stuff and be like, OK, now I know why you are the number one rated player in the country. And now I could see kind of what your ceiling could be at the next level. With Duke, too, it's first year without Coach K. So you don't know what – I don't really know what to take from that. There's probably all kinds of different things they were trying to work through and stuff. Like it, There's just a lot of – there's a lot of muddiness, to me at least, with, with trying to evaluate him. So you have to you have to look at the, the skills, the intangibles, see what he has. Again, like Isaac said, look at some of his high school stuff. Uh, the, the upgrade from Roach, which is their point guard at Duke, the upgrade from him to a playmaking point – in the NBA and him playing with a playmaking point like a Luka Doncic or somebody like they're going to be able to maximize his skills on the offensive end to a whole different level. And the NBA just, the NBA has these type of guys all over the place. These rim runner that can defend the rim, that can move out in space a little bit and is stepping out to take a shot. Like that is the, that's the prototypical five in the NBA that you want right now. And I think he can, I think he can do that. I think he can be that, but coming up, let's talk about, his uh, strengths and weaknesses. We'll go through all the different things we think he's great at, all the things he needs to improve on, uh, and the things that he could do right away in the NBA. So we'll talk about that coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs has great stuff. Great shorts. I've been I've been tempted to check out the pants, the joggers. Because oh, the, shorts, them out. the shorts are just so good. Uh, you can wear them in a meeting. You can wear them on the beach. You can wear them out. You can wear them to any restaurant. Uh, they, they're just awesome. They're so comfortable. They have a lining in them. So they say they, Isaac, they say that you don't have to wear underwear with them. Um, I still do, but you, you didn't, you wouldn't have to, I guess. you don't have to, I still do as well, but you can, I, I can imagine myself not wearing underwear with them and maybe it'd be the most freeing feeling in the world. Check it out at bird dogs, go to bird dogs.com slash locked on NBA. And now if you use that promo code locked on NBA. You'll get a free Yeti style tumbler. So put your coffee in it, put some, 
I don't know. Put whatever you want in. It's Friday. Uh, BirdDogs.com slash NBA. Get that free Tumblr. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise. Again, BirdDogs.com slash NBA. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Locked On Mavs, making us your part of your day. Being, being a Raccoon Squad member, if you listen every day, you're part of the Raccoon Squad no matter where you are, who you want to trade for, who you want to draft, whatever it is. Well, there's certain people that if you want to trade for them. Who you choose to love in the draft. You can- <laughs> hey, can, let me say this real quick about him personally. I meant to say this in the first segment, but a couple things about him personally. He was on the swim team and the football team in high school. I can't find – I've been – I've been searching the webs to find Derek Lively football tape. Okay, you got to search the pool. The, the what? For his swim, for his swim stuff. You're looking, uh, I would cool. like to see him a seven foot one guy in a, in a swim meet. That's what I would want to <laughs> yeah. see against like regular dudes. His story, um, his story is pretty wild too. Like what all he's went through already at the age of, you know, age of 19, his mother was an all time basketball player at Penn state. Um, but just his story, go go read about his uh, his story. He lost his dad uh, super, super young. And then his mom um, has been raising him. His mom has walked through cancer and stuff, too. And it's just a uh, what he's already walked through at 19. Um, it's pretty crazy. And, and it's a it's a crazy story to look at. And just his journey as a top prospect and all the all the stuff with that. So uh, go go research that if, if you have time. Yeah, great stuff. His strengths, let's just start with just size, length, defensive tools. He's mobile, good athlete, light on his feet, pretty good feet in space, too, on defense. Like seven foot one, great size for a center. Seven foot seven, seven foot eight wingspan. Like depending on who you ask and who who's asked. Like he's just got those tools. I mean, that that's Rudy Gobert stuff. Like that those are Rudy Gobert dimensions, basically. Yeah. He's got to bulk up to get to where Rudy Gobert is. Uh, but just the the length and the tools and the the foot like agility, I think, is gonna be awesome at the next level. Yeah, I mean, you just can't, you know, one of the biggest things that, about him that you watch him is just his length of, you know, when you have anybody with a with, with a wingspan that's over seven five, especially a guy that's seven, you know, foot one. Um because you, you kind of, you know, this is kind of touching on weakness, but when you go back and when I went back and watched some of the tape, he was a little bit slower than I, than I remembered him being. Um, but you also have to remind yourself he's seven one. Like, yeah, he's, he's a, big. He, he, he is a legit big out there. He's seven one with that seven seven wingspan. And I mean, the, the most, one of the most, if not the most impressive thing about him is how, mu- how much he could defend the, you know, defend the rim but just alter everything around the basket. And that's that Rudy Gobert effect of, I mean, with a seven, seven wingspan that that can jump like him too. He can deter anything out there. So he's got upside too. Like you mentioned, number one recruit in 2022, this could be, this could be what the Mavs do in the draft. They're like, all right, we're just going to take the number one high school guy. They took Jaden Hardy last year and like, Hey, he's dropping. We'll, We'll take this guy, Derek lively this year. Like maybe that's the, the, the play, but he's got some, He's got some ability to be to be really good and to be better than what he showed at Duke. Like you said, it, yeah. it's hard to try and evaluate what he did at Duke and say that's that's who he is. That's exactly who he can be as a player. Yeah, I mean, look at some of his transition stuff. I mean, last year points per possession, he was one point four points per possession in transition. Didn't have a ton of you know ton of possessions at Duke in transition, but He'll the run Duke. The floor. He, the Duke can get out and run the floor. We've talked about defending the rim and his blocks. His block numbers are insane. Uh, and but you know, as a big, you got to look at how he can run the pick and roll. And last year, twenty basically twenty six percent of his offensive possessions was as the roll man in the pick and roll at Duke. And I mean, it's still it's still a college game. I mean, that's just going to to blow up in the NBA. He's going to be running the pick and roll all the time. And in that, he had one point five points per possession, which in the college, if You've heard us talk about the synergy percentage and all that stuff. He was in a 97th percentile as a role man. He was incredible at that. So take take those small sample numbers in college, playing with a Roach. I say Roach. A Ro- <laughs> uh, um, Jeremy Roach there. This guy was um, a cockroach. Just, a, just but, an awful human being. And just imagine him playing with a Luka Doncic. Imagine him playing with a... Uh, a Trey young or, you know, somebody who can run the pick and roll and stuff and and throw lobs to him and stuff. So that's where it's like the NBA is going to maximize what he's good at. Yeah. And he, and he's prototypical for it. Like lob 
lob threat, rim runner. Those are those are tools yeah. and, and things that you really want to see at the next level. Uh, he's got also some upside as a shooter. We saw if you saw his workout. Uh, where there's just a bunch of people around him and he's just drilling three after three after three in the corner. And I think his shot looks pretty good. Like I think his shot <laughs> okay, yeah. looks pretty good overall, at least in that workout. It was it was looking pretty solid and pretty smooth. And like he didn't take a lot how many threes did he take in eight. Yeah, not not many. Not no, many no. in game. I think I think it was like ten or twelve. Was not many in game action, but he's uh yeah, what Two, Here, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen total threes he took. But but he, he projects hit, he hit two. That's a skill. Yeah, that's a skill that he could add in the future. You're talking a couple years down the down the road, but he's not but, it's not like a he won't shoot kind of big. Here here's the thing. We gotta have the shooting conversation for a second. This is one of the biggest things that unlocks like the full poten- potential of him. His shot looks really good. Like it's not one of those shots where you're like, man, this is broke, or it's a, you know, Il- Ilgowskis just set shot. It. He's, you know, he's yeah, he's forcing it. He looks like Dwight Howard shooting a three. You know, it, it's nothing like that. Um, he actually jumps. He actually has good form on it. Um, yes, the pro day just sent everybody scrambling. Okay, because like you said, he shot what thirteen threes at Duke. If you're in the camp that's saying, all right, this dude hit two threes in his whole time at Duke. And some people are touting him as a stretch five. Let me remind you because I went, I went and looked this up today. Oh, tell me Carl Anthony towns at Kentucky in his one year at Kentucky attempted eight, three pointers (laughs) and only hit two of them. This guy claims that he is the best shooting big man of all time. Okay. Okay. Guy, the slander (laughs) on this podcast. Uh, but it just goes to show you that just because you can't or you didn't do something in college doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, I'm not saying that I think Lively is going to be in a three point you know contest in year two, but he you at least are encouraged by the form and everything. And I, I did laugh because I do think you know the pro days are sometimes a little overblown. There's nobody in front of him. He's taking him. He's taking like one yeah. after the other. Perfect passes right to him over. It's like okay, how do, none of this is game <laughs> yeah. action stuff. Drain and them. I think there's a clip of him making like 14 straight corner threes. Yes. I'm like, guys, I have watched Dwight Powell yeah, hit three yeah. <laughs> after three at practice with my own eyes. Um, so, so I say all that to say is I'm not, I don't think he's, you know, seven foot one Clay Thompson. I also don't think he is Bismack Biombo from three either. So I, I think he could be a, I do think he can be a stretch, stretch five in the league. I do think the shot will will be fine, and he'll impress a lot of people. He also had more assists than turnovers. He's got really good passing instincts. A couple of, a couple mm. of draft people. By the way, I take I take a lot of different things from draft people. Rafael Barlow, NBA Big Board, obviously locked on NBA Big Board. Uh, Rafael has stock a lot of apartment complexes and houses on Lively Island, and he took a turn on him because he wasn't high on him early. Because m- remember, we had him on a couple of a couple weeks ago, I guess now. And he's been doing some more work on him, seeing more things from him, and he's he's got him now. Like he would absolutely take him at ten. Uh, I I'll talk about that in a minute, but yeah, he, he so I take from Rafael, take from from the Ringer KOC, take from the Athletic and San Vicini and all of them, and compile it together, and that's where I get a lot of my information. But yeah, more assist and turnovers, good passing instincts, and uh, yeah, any more strengths? No, I mean we hit a lot. We hit yeah. He he just does the, does a lot of things that are good in the NBA and that you can project out. Uh, he's not just go to weaknesses, things to improve on. He's not a great rebounder struggled against some bigger bodies in college. Um, he's going to get rebounds cause he's big and he's got really long arms, but there are times when he gets pushed or like, even when he was, de- even when he was defending in the post and stuff, you'd see him get pushed out of his position or be out of position, you know, defense, defensive fundamentals need to improve. And I think that goes into rebounding as well, that he's just not in position. A lot of times, again, it's a college thing that it's hard to project. If that's if that's because of confusion with what, they're, what they were running or where he was in that situation or not, but those are things that, that have to improve for him. For sure, he fouls a lot. Um, yeah. You know, he, he's just kind of raw with that. When you look at some of his uh, defending in the post numbers, they're not good. So um, now you have to ask yourself at the next level: Are you defending a ton in the post? You know, if it's not Embiid, Jokic, some of these guys, how many goods are actually posting up in the NBA that are or that are bigs? 
you know. Well, it, it wasn't like back downs to me. The ones, the possessions that I saw was like he's he's either fronting or he's behind a guy, and all of a sudden, like he looks the wrong way, and a guy is in position, and then gets the ball real quick for a post up, and he's all of a sudden like in ba- in bad position, like in bad guarding position. Like okay, it was just, it was gotta a, be in the yeah. right spot. It was a little combo of both for me. I because I went, I, I noticed that that bad rating on synergy, and I noticed the bad numbers on there. Uh, for him defensively in those possessions. So I went yeah. back and I just watched him in, on, you know, this full repeat clip and, you know, yeah, some of them it's bad decision-making. Some of them, he just gets overpowered right. and it's just like, how is this happening? You're seven one. Um, so he's got to figure out how to defend, you know, some of these bigger bodies in the, in the, in the paint. He's got to figure out how not to foul. Um, the free throw percentage is like 60%. So that's yeah, something that goes against him when it comes to the, you know, some people really look at that number when it, trying to project shooting at the next level. Uh, that doesn't help his case with that. So, you know, it, it's kind of like the cons are if you're trying to make the case of him being an all time great. <laughs> it's because when you look at the other things that make him that will will kind of translate at the next level, those there's no question marks about them. That's why he, I think he has a high floor as a big. Yeah, uh, he's he does have a really high floor. Another thing that was mentioned a couple times, he doesn't have a great motor, but his motor was better at Duke than it was in high school. That's something that a couple people mm. pointed out. He avoids physicality, needs to bulk up. To your point, getting pushed around or moved around, he was he was two fifteen at one point in college. <laughs> either when he started, like seven foot one, two fifteen. That's a really small. Guy. Some of his high school stuff, he's he's pretty dang skinny. That's yeah. where I was like a little thrown off because. Some of his high school stuff, he looks way more mobile and agile and kind of like explosive. He still did, has some, you know, explosive stuff at Duke, but at yeah. Duke, he had obviously bulked up a little bit more. And I think, I don't know, just give me, I feel like he slowed down just a tad at Duke. Another thing that I know will drive Mavericks fans crazy is he doesn't make contact on screens. <laughs> that's something Raphael oh, pointed. That's something Raphael pointed out. And I was like, oh, he's so right. Cause you'll see him set a screen and it'll just be like a little chicken, like a little chicken wing out where his elbow hits yeah. the player, but not his whole body. He's gonna get called for that all the time. He's gonna need a Dwight Powell type of guy to be like, yeah. this is how you set screens at the next level of that. Coming up, let's get into his availability, ceiling floor. We'll talk about why the Mavericks should take him and why they shouldn't take him. Coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook has you covered for everything that you could want. Right now, they have a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. You can make a bet, and you get $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. They have all kinds of things. Uh, they have more stuff for the NBA draft. They've got – do they have the 10th pick? They don't have the 10th pick. They have Ooh. up to the 5th pick. Do you want to do these? Victor Wembanyama. Guess what the odds are right now for him to go number one? Oh gosh, I don't even know what the highest minus twenty thousand. Holy crap! You'd have to put down twenty thousand dollars to win a hundred dollars for him to get drafted number one. <laughs> but if you put down what like ten bucks and he doesn't go number one for whatever reason, you win two thousand dollars. Might be worth it. That's crazy. <laughs> Second pick, uh, Brandon Miller minus two hundred. Scoot Henderson plus 135. So they think that Brandon Miller is going to be the number two pick for uh, number three. They have Scoot Henderson minus 175. Brandon Miller plus 175. Uh, for the fifth pick, they have Cam Whitmore. The fourth pick, they have uh, Amon Thompson. And then the fifth pick, they have Cam Whitmore going to the Pistons. So all kinds of stuff. They have the draft, they have the NBA, they have uh, hockey. You can check out MLB with the Rangers and all that. You can check out everything at FanDuel. Again, go to fanduel.com slash locked on. No sweat, first bet. FanDuel.com slash Lockdown. All right, Isaac, we're talking about Derek Lively, the big from Duke. Should he be the pick for the Mavericks at 10? I did recently a mock draft with, um, I did a mock draft with Grind City Media, the mm, the yeah. Grizzlies, the Grizzlies like media company. I with, love what they do at that. With, with Kelsey Wright. And she, uh, she had me on and did a mock draft and I picked it. I picked Derek Lively. Uh, Jairus Walker was gone. Taylor Hendricks was gone. Anthony Black was gone. Like it was, I was, I was at the point. I was like, all right, it's well, either. It was that next. It was that next wave. Like we've been talking about how it cuts off at nine, right? For a lot of mocks, and then that next wave is the Grady Dick, Kaysen Wallace, Kaysen Wallace, you know, the scoring guards there, Keontae George, Nick Smith, Derek Lively, those type of guys. And so I was in that next spot, and I was like, I was basically deciding between Derek Lively, Kaysen Wallace, Grady Dick. And I was like, okay, Raphael, 
Uh, Richard Stamen, Mavs draft, and Leaf Tuline. Tell me who you would pick. Like literally three draft experts. Tell me, and they were all like, "All right, I take I take Derek Lively at this point," and so they're all comfortable with it. Um, Raphael in his big board after the uh, after the lottery had him at seventeen, but I think now he has him going to the Mavericks at ten. Um, the Ringer had him at twelve. ESPN on lottery night had him at twenty five, which now seems like forever ago. And the Athletic has him at ten going to the Mavericks as well. So it seems now that he's, it was maybe a reach like on lottery night for the Mavericks to take Derek Lively. And now he's risen to the point where it just makes a lot of sense for the Mavericks to take him. Uh, But let's talk about ceiling floor. What type of ceiling could you see for him in the NBA? And what kind of floor could you see for him? I was, I was actually looking at some of my names of like other risers. Cause you look at that cool, cool, Oh yeah, Bilal. Right? Like, I, I still have. I still don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Kulabali. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Well, like you look at like him and Derek Lively. I feel like those are the two names that have kind of risen up the most as far as like that. You know, twenties up into the teens. Now up into like the the late lottery there. Yeah. Um. For him, yeah. I mean, I I think you could see him as a starter. I think you could see him as a backup big. I don't. I don't. I mean, I could just be like wrong here. I just don't see a a, a world in which he's like not at least a backup big on a roster. Yeah. Um, like my, my, my like ceiling floor for him was like the floor would be end of the bench because of foul trouble and nobody to make plays for him. If he doesn't have somebody to make plays for him, then what is he, what's he doing out there? Like, like what's he doing on offense? He's, he'd be perfect for anybody that has a playmaking guard or some kind of playmaking wing or somebody that can, that can run a pick and roll with him. If he doesn't have that and all of a sudden, like if he, he goes to Houston What's he, what's he doing in Houston? <laughs> like, yeah. Really? Like, and then foul prone, depending on what kind of system he's, the, you know, the defense runs for him. I could see them just like shrinking back, but I think his ceiling could be like a Jared Allen type all-star. Remember when Jared Allen made the all-star team, yep. <laughs> the all-star team. Like I could see him getting to that point and being just like a really solid, like high level top 10 type center. Yeah, I put, I put uh, we can go ahead and talk about some comp names. I just yeah. threw a bunch of, bunch of names out there. Um, Jared Allen's one of the names. Yeah, I did too. You know, I, I think if you're Derek Lively's camp, you're looking at, you're telling teams saying, look at the impact Walker Kessler had last year. Yes. Why can't we, why can't we have that impact? Why can't, he can defend the rim like him. He can get out and run. Like he can, he can do some of these things. Now, you know, Kessler's not, draining threes and stuff i think that's the thing that you know lively's probably telling uh his campus is telling people i think he's clutch right oh i don't he's know clutch. That. yeah that's a good question um but i think i think clutch and those guys are you know they're probably telling every team out there like uh he's going to uh, stretch the floor and uh do this thing and defend the paint he is clutch. i'm picking he's clutch um I put Gen Z Brooke Lopez. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to put Brooke Lopez in there, but it's it's not early Brooke Lopez, like rookie Brooke Lopez. It's like now Brooke Lopez. Yeah, like what's the if if Brooke Lopez came out now uh, into the league, what would he be? And and I see something like that of you know or, or a younger version of this Brooke Lopez, somebody that can defend the paint like him, um, somebody that can you know pick and pop um, some of that stuff, but. Lively's a little bit more explosive than him. So, yeah, I mean, two other names I wrote down was like Miles Turner and Yaka Pertle. Yeah. You know, just two of those. I, I, I'm i not here. I feel like some some side I saw Willie Cauley Stein. That was the ringer. I ha- I ha- wrote that one out. Like if he's that, if he, if he doesn't maximize any of his potential, basically, is he could come in and beat yeah. that guy. But <sighs> Willie, Willie was such a, I mean, top tier. You want to see some like highlight athletic dunks in yes. college? You go back and look at Willie at Kentucky. I mean, some of the stuff was just insane. That lively wasn't like that, like springy in high school. He's a little like skinnier and stuff. So I, I'm not in love with that comp. And I think lively's you know, just a better overall player than Willie. So I don't know. I, that, that's why, but you look at some of these guys like the Jared Allen's of the world and Brooke Lopez and Walker Kessler and Yaka Pertle, like they have a defined role in this league yeah. and teams really value them. So that's what, yeah, I think that's his path. Yeah. You could see a Nick Claxton too. Um, maybe with, you know, with the jumper a little bit more. Yeah. And, bigger, bigger Claxton. But I mean, he's coming in, he came in skinny too, but then uh, it could also like, Aiton a little bit like you could you could see if he wanted a bigger offensive role mm. if he uh you know he settles for jumpers that's something that Raphael wrote about him that 
Like he settles for jumpers too often, not just threes, but like actual jumpers. And Aiton does that a lot. Doesn't have the post game really. Like you can kind of see that a little bit if if things start not going great. That, that's <laughs> that's what separates him from. If you're listening to saying, all right, what? Why can't he be an Anthony Davis, Joel Embiid? Like why? What will be yeah. that? I did, I don't believe in the in the touch around the basket like Embiid had at Kansas. I don't believe in like the the face up. He's not going to yeah, face up, it. create like type of thing. I think it's more of the rim roll, catch lobs. It's pick and pop. It's it's what Brooke Lopez do, you know does right now, but like a younger, more you know athletic version of that, which is a, a really good thing to have in the league. His future role, uh, he would eventually work his way into twenty to twenty five minutes a night in season one for the Mavericks. I think. I don't think it would start from from day one. But I think he would work his way in there if they didn't make any other, like if they didn't make any other moves. And you're saying, all right, your rotation is lively. Maxi, Dwight Powell comes back on some kind of minimum, and JaVale McGee. Like that's your big man rotation. I think lively would work his way into 20 to 25 minutes a night. He'd almost have, like, this is my thing with the 10th pick. It, whoever, whoever, if you st- stamp out at 10 and you take somebody, yeah, they got to, they got to be giving you 20 minutes a night. So, Eventually, yeah, it's at some point in the season. At, at some point, the rookie season, like you're trying to win now, you can't take just a complete project, or you can't take a guy and just like stash him on the bench and just wait a year or two. Okay, why should the maps take him? Why shouldn't they take him? <sighs> um, I I think I am. Uh, I'm I'm probably in the camp of leaning uh, away. Um, that high. And I know it's like somebody's listening and saying like, hey, you, you just hyped him up forever. Um, it, here's the deal. I'm about him. I'm about him as a prospect. I'm about him in Dallas, um, but like two or three years from now in Dallas. And I think where Dallas is at right now, like if they traded back, you know, two, three, four, five spots and said, and they got a, 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 a solidified like veteran in the rotation and then they got lively, then yes, the, take him because I think he'll fit in Dallas long-term and be great addition to Luca. I, I'm a, I would be a little bit scared if they stood pat at 10 and then they just took lively because when you start looking at things, you start looking at other bigs and it's like you, you would be asking him, are you still going to go out and spend a good chunk of money or a big investment on a right, big right at that point? And then if you are, you just spent the tenth pick on lively, so I would assume that if you spent the tenth pick on lively and you don't go out and spend, invest big on a big, now you're betting on Derek Lively, a rookie yes, big, right. playing big minutes in a playoff series, and that's just uh, you just don't really see that, you know, very often with with teams. Why? So, so that, that's 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 why not. Why they should take him for me? Because he's exactly what they want as a five. Like, mm. if they believe that he can come in and contribute and do all the things that we project him to be able to do, maybe add the shot, but mostly just defend the rim really well and rim roll and, and get catch lobs. Like, if he can do those two things, you think he can do it from day one? He, I think it, he's a, he'd be a great pick if they don't – if no other trades come up. If they're like, there's no other trade we can do. Like, none of these are good trades. Everybody knows that we're going to trade the pick, so they're just trying to swindle us. And they're like, all right, we're just going to take a guy. I think this is a good guy to take. You know what would have been awesome? And they wouldn't have the 10th pick if this was the case. If somehow they just kept Brunson and they had the same team from the Western Conference Finals and they had this pick and you're like, oh, yeah, they, that could, been possible. they could pick Lively and then all of a sudden bring him up and like t- maybe it takes maybe it takes a year or two. Then he comes into his just – it would just be a perfect scenario. Like I, I They so, wouldn't have a pick this high though. Well, that's what I just or said. Or the pick would have been went to New York. That's what I said. But <laughs> but they, um, maybe, they, maybe they trade up. Maybe they trade up and, and get him like – they decided to do something with Josh Green or something. Like, I don't know. But if they had yeah. if they had that that roster and this pick, like it would just be that'd be a perfect. But they don't have the they don't have the the patience to do that right now. So why shouldn't yeah. they take him? Is because they need to they need something right now. Like they yeah. they can't be patient on it. Like, oh, the all the all the people that have said, well, taking the taking the shortcut is why the Mavericks are are where they are. Okay, but they they don't have time to wait for two years, three years for some yeah. you know a rookie to come in and take that long. And it takes it takes guys that long. It take took Nick Claxton four years to be able to figure it out in the NBA. It took you know Miles Turner a couple years to be able to to get to like starting as good level as Walker for the Kessler Pacers. was. You know, took him. Yeah, they didn't make the playoffs. So like, and, and he I didn't get start it. right like, away for them. Yeah. So here's my thing with Lively. I like him. I like him more than some of the other guys in, in that like. 
there's a couple of guys through that range in that next group that I would put him right there in. Like I wouldn't be flaming out of my ears pissed if they took him <laughs> at 10 on that the pod that night. I'd be yeah. like, all right, hey, I get it. Like it would I, I would I get it. I think I would lean towards a case in Wallace over him if we're just looking at those two versus each other. Um yeah, so like I think he's in that group. I would take him over like a Nick Smith or some of these other guys. Um but yeah, you're just I think it's it's pretty risky taking him at 10, but who am I? I would take him over Grady Dick. Yeah. 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 So, uh let us know in the comment section though, would you take him if no other trades materialize? Lively Dick, Lively Dick. I don't know, it's kind of a it's a tough debate. <laughs> let us know in the comment section, guys. Thanks so much for listening to Lockdown Mavs. Peace out.